In 1767, Parliament passes the Townsend Duties. The citizens of Boston will view this as more taxation without representation, and they'll react. The British government responds by sending two regiments of British troops to Boston to restore order and enforce British laws. The presence of these soldiers only increased tensions. Not only did these troops represent oppression to Bostonians, they also competed for jobs. British soldiers earned a pretty meager wage and had to pick up side jobs when they were off duty to make ends meet. This put them in direct competition with the citizens of Boston for unskilled labor positions. This only served to increase the tensions and clashes, be clashes between Bostonians and Redcoats became common. On the night of March 5th, 1770, a small group of boys began taunting a British sentry guarding the Boston Custom House. Eventually, the soldier had had enough and hit one of the boys with his musket. Word of the incident made its way through town and the crowd grew to 50 or 60 people. The sentry then called for help. Captain Thomas Preston and seven British soldiers then went to the Customs House to protect the sentry. By the time they arrived, the crowd had increased to over 100 people, many anxious for a fight. Church bells continued to toll, which usually alerted the people of Boston to a fire, causing the crowd to grow even more. Preston and his men soon found themselves surrounded and unable to retreat to safety. One soldier fired into the crowd, then one by one the other soldiers fired their weapons. The result was five dead and six wounded. Preston and his men would be charged with murder and the leaders of the resistance movement in Boston would use this as propaganda, calling it the Boston Massacre. A working definition of propaganda is the spreading of ideas, information, or rumor for the purpose of helping or injuring an institution, a cause, or a person. While propaganda is most evident in times of war, as in the Revere engraving, it is constantly being used as a political and social means in even less obvious ways to influence people's attitudes. Let us look at a single incident in American history from the perspective of the colonists and the British and learn the effectiveness of propaganda to inspire social and political change. The first perspective is that of Captain Thomas Preston. The mobs still increased and were outrageous, striking their clubs or bludgeons once the mobs still increased and were outrageous, striking their clubs or bludgeons one against another and calling out, Come on, you rascals, you bloody backs, you lobster scoundrels, fire if you dare, damn you, fire and be damned. We know you dare not, and much more such language was used. At this time, I was between the soldiers and the mob, trying with all my power to persuade them to retire peaceably, but to no avail. The crowd advanced to the points of the bayonets, struck some of them and even the muzzles of the guns, and seemed to be endeavoring to close in on the soldiers. Some well-behaved man asked me if the guns were charged. I replied, yes. Then they asked me if I intended to order the men to fire. I answered, no, by no means, observing to them that I was in front of the soldiers' guns and would be shot if I ordered them to fire. While I was speaking, one of the soldiers, after receiving a severe blow with a stick by someone in the crowd, stepped to one side and instantly fired. This was met with an attack on him from the crowd with heavy clubs. It became clear that our lives were in danger. At the same time, some in the crowd began calling, Damn you, Bloods, why don't you fire? Instantly, three or four of the soldiers fired. I asked them why they fired without orders, to which they replied that they had heard the word fire and supposed it came from me. This might be the case as many of the mob called out, fire, fire, but I assured the men that I gave no such order, that my words were, don't fire, stop your firing. Now we'll take a look at two colonial perspectives. Hearing the bells ring for what I th thought was a fire, I went out and came down by the main guard. I saw some soldiers with fixed bayonet come up to guard the sentry and the officer told them to create a half moon in front of the custom house. The captain told the boys to go home, lest there should be murder done. The boys were throwing snowballs. They did not go away, but instead threw more snowballs. The captain, who was behind the soldiers, told them to fire. One gun went off. A man from the crowd, which was about seven feet away, struck the captain. The captain then said, Damn you bloods, fire! Seven or eight of them then fired one after another. It was clear to me that the order to fire came from the officer. I could not see his face, but I know that is where the order came from. 
And here is a differing colonial perspective. I saw, I saw one soldier knocked down. His gun fell from him. I saw a great many sticks and pieces of sticks and ice thrown at the soldiers. The soldier, who was knocked down, took up his gun and fired directly. Soon after the first gun, I saw a gentleman behind the soldiers in velvet of blue or black plush trimmed with gold. He put his hand toward their back. Whether he touched them, I know not, and said, By God, I'll stand by you whilst, whilst I have a drop of blood, and then said, Fire, and two went off, and the rest, seven or eight. The captain, after, seemed shocked and looked upon the soldiers. I'm very certain he did not give the word fire. Paul Revere's engraving was produced just three weeks after the Boston Massacre. This engraving would help to shape public opinion. It would be the description of the massacre for many Americans. Consider what you see when looking at it. Preston Brooks with his sword up, giving the command to fire. All of the soldiers firing simultaneously. A dog in the crowd. I mean, really, what type of heartless person would fire into a crowd with a dog in it? This is the account that will be circulated throughout the, the colonies, the only one that many people will hear, and it served a purpose of presenting the event as a cold, calculated murder.